Um, so, greetings to all. Um, I'm truly excited to take part in this um, rather excited conference. Um, many thanks to colleague uh, Zdravko Kobe for uh, inviting me. Uh, special thanks to my colleague Bojana Jovicevic uh, for her effort regarding uh, all sorts of pre-technical conference support. Uh, but also, what I would like uh, uh, to specially uh, underline that uh, I would like to thank previous uh, fellow panelists for breaking the ice and setting the stage for us. Um, let's be honest, the gesture of dedicating the complete conference program to the relation of Hegel and the gender are still uh, a true rarity. So as you heard, the title of my presentation, um, The Victims of Dialectical March, Hegel Ontology of Gender and Social Reproduction. Um, so while preparing a topic that would suggest a feminist reading of Hegel, I immediately found myself in a methodological dilemma. Should I start with the notes uh, on Hegel or with feminism? I decided to go with the latter. The decision to set up the discussion by distinguishing different feminist strands in reading of Hegel and insisting on a Marxist feminist approach will fully consciously determine the tone and the mood of my talk, but it will also open up a space for certain feminist disagreements about factual and conceptual issues related to Hegel's philosophy. So, I will try to take our discussions a step further, namely in the direction of feminist reading of Hegel, therefore, not just on the level of exploring the role of gender in Hegel's works, or discussing ontology of gender and sexual difference, which are, of course, respectively very important subjects. Over the last 40 years, feminism, philosophy of gender, women's and gender studies, feminist philosophy, queer philosophy, feminist epistemology, feminist dialectics, her story of ideas instead of history of ideas, have analyzed in different ways the philosophical canon that ignores or excludes women from the history of philosophy. Or, if the canon marginally mentions them, it still underestimates female philosophers, often affirms uh, sexism and misogyny in its ontological approaches. There is no one unquestionable and universally applicable feminist reading of Hegel. Pioneering work in this field was indicated by Simone de Beauvoir with her existentialist phenomenological treatment of essentialism in the second sex in the late 1940s. She opens up a Hegelian thesis that gender develops throughout history that is not a static, given and finished social fact. In my talk today, I will just briefly sketch three different feminist readings of Hegel which share certain points of departure but differ from each other in their methods and goals. I will start with the Yugoslav Hegelian Marxist and member of Praxis School, Blaženka Despot, in the first part of the paper. Then I will move to Italian feminist Carla Lonzi and the political philosopher Sela Benhabib. All three authors, moving from their standpoint, different historical context and their unique philosophical motives offer diverse readings and criticisms of Hegel. Blaženka Despot develops a Marxist feminist interpretation of Hegel's philosophy. Karla Lonsi, a radical feminist one, and Sela Ben Habib, a liberal feminist perspective. In the second part of the paper, my modest intention is to complement Despot's Marxist feminist approach to Hegel with the theory of social reproduction and to point out uh, to some of the shortcomings of the other two interpretations. I argue that Lonzi's radical feminist and Ben Habib's liberal feminist reading of Hegel are actually not dialectical. In addition, an equally important topic of my talk is uh, an attempt to answer the question whether Hegel's philosophy is useful for contemporary feminist progressive ideas. What about the victims of his dialectical march? So let me start with Blaženka Despot and Marxist feminist reading of Hegel. In her essay, What the Women Defined as Men's Thought, 
Blaschenka Despot summarizes her Marxist feminist inclination regarding Hegel's philosophy and writes the following. With his philosophy, with his intervention on freedom, Hegel becomes a necessary starting point for the foundation of a certain Marxist feminism. In his Gothic construction, of which the ancients knew nothing about, in determining freedom on the discernment of the general will, Hegel trained his own grave diggers, Marxism and feminism, end of quote. Starting from Hegel's overcoming of metaphysics, Despot analyzes the concept of absolute philosophy, asking about the instruments of freedom, the struggle over the passions and the cunning of the reason. This thematic and conceptual framework gives her theoretical space to examine the Hegelian relationship between history and nature in more detail through Marxist feminist lenses. Since there is no freedom in the state of nature and the history only starts from there, Despot raises the questions about the gender differences between the subjects of freedom, especially if there is no mediation between the nature and history. Since women substantially belong to the realm of nature and not to that of history, and that freedom refers to passions that are consequently devoid of reason and its limitations, that means that women are not mediated by the positive right and the state which enable actualization of objective freedom. Almost paradoxically, argues Despot, Hegel in effect builds architecture of the objective spirit, more precisely of ethical life, by prepositioning patriarchy as the first assumption of freedom. The unmediated unity of family life that presents a first stage of system of ethical life covers the realm of nature. It represents the place of intimacy, a key structural unit responsible for social reproduction, care for children and elderly, including biological reproduction. Since freedom in itself and for itself is not obtained through the idea which is part of nature life, the family that is dark sentiment, mud to absolute spirit, as Hegel formulates it in Philosophy of History, also presuppositions the world history taken as a progress toward a consciousness of freedom and therefore needs to be mediated. The fact that this unity is only felt, of course, and is not mediated by reason is the crucial defi de deficiency of family life. Since freedom does not exist in nature, mediation of freedom must be carried out in the field of right. The demand for equality in the sphere of morality and right is an abstraction, pure desire, mediocrity of spirit in the elements of the philosophy of right, Hegel notes. Equality is the abstract identity of the understanding. It is the first thing which occurs to reflective thought and hence to mediocrity of spirit in general. One cannot speak of injustice of nature in the unequal distribution of possessions and resources for nature is not free and is therefore neither just or unjust. That all human beings should have their livelihood to meet their needs is, on the one hand, a moral wish. But like everything that is merely well-intentioned, it has no objective being." End of quote. Blaschenka Despot claims ethic life is tragic. That is her summary of Hegel's Antigone. Tragedy, described in Antigone, argues Despot, individualized femininity as an emotional, subjective substantiality is the untouched nature that defines women's position. The sex becomes a women's destiny. Moreover, husband and wife, as two separate consciousness, cannot even establish the relationship of slave and master. Therefore, a slave has a history, being a slave is not a destiny. Women, however, become victims of the dialectical march. They have no history, nature is their destiny. Even more, a wife cannot be placed in relation to her husband as consciousness to consciousness. She is not a free person, she is not a subject, in Hegel's words. The family as a legal person in relation to others 
must be represented by the husband as its head, as we already heard today. In addition, he is primarily responsible for external acquisition and for caring for the family needs, as well as for the control and administration of family's resources. In this case, as argued by Despot, in the non-abolished nature occurs the so-called women's issues as a problem of the declared equality of civil society and as a specific gender problem in the relation to the class problem. The limitation of freedom, writes Despot, pushes a woman below the level of emancipation of the class to which she belongs to. A woman can only have a legal representative or guardian for the disposal of her property. When the state is obliged, due to its universality and the realization of freedom, to enact laws and rights regulating the sphere of civil society, it does not touch the monogamous patriarchal family because the family reproduces its foundations and is the main engine of social reproduction. This ethical dismissal takes place thanks to social reproductions in the sphere of family life, which enables the transi transition to so civil society. But at the same time, the socialization of sons as elders and daughters as wives. Marxist feminist reading of Hegel's system of right stems from the logic of flow that goes from private property, sphere of abstract right, through morality towards the family, civil society, and the state. Private property is the assumption of a free person. Possession represents the objectification of my will for an object. Freedom understood in this way overcomes metaphysics and abstraction. It must be mediated by appearances, concrete universal, customs, ethics, rights, and regulations. Only then do we act freely and are guided by reason, not as natural and unfree beings. It is precisely in this line of understanding that we take the termination of ethical life as that which preserves marriage, family, civil society, and state. As an immediate customary relationship, marriage represents a right and a duty. Hegel writes. The ethical aspect of marriage consists in the consciousness of this union as a substantial end, hence in love, trust, and the sharing of the whole of individual existence. When this disposition and actuality are present, the natural drive is reduced to the modality of a moment of nature which is destined to be extinguished in its very satisfaction. The consequence of this logic is as follows. Mutual relationships, relations between natural beings and between men and women are not free unless they are codified by the institution of marriage. The abolition of natural relations in right or in marriage is actualized by the simultaneous process of the overcoming of individuality and becoming a member of the family. However, this is also where a key philosophical gender problem arises, because this abolition of nature for men and women does not take place in the same way. Again, Hegel writes, the natural determinacy of the two sexes acquires an intellectual and ethical significance by virtue of its rationality. This significance is determined by the difference into which the ethical substantiality as the concept in itself divides itself up in order that its vitality may thereby achieve a concrete unity. Just a few lines later in the famous 166 paragraph of the philosophy of right in which we can detect the basis of the phenomena of the victims of the dialectical march, Hegel underlines how, quote, 
The one sex is therefore spirituality, which divides itself up into personal self-sufficiency with being for itself and the knowledge and volition of the free universality, while the other is represented in the form of concrete individuality and feeling. The one is powerful and active, the latter passive and subjective." End of quote. This difference comes from the absolute method, argues Blaženka Despot. The natural difference between the sexes exists so that substantiality in ethical life could be split in and for itself and eventually be mediated by freedom when natural in beings is abolished in order for them to become a unity. Free members in marriage and family determined, of course, by different social roles. Once we establish a family that rests on the abolition of personhood, in which the abolition for once is transformed into the field of spiritual and for others into a material realm, once into active, others in the passive, and all this in the name of freedom, the final calculation rests upon the specific gender division of labor within the family unit. The person as a subject is the one who is the infinite will, morality as the sphere where a person is to be established as the subject, uh, as the infinite will for oneself, means to be subordinated the property understood as a true topos of freedom and equality, the difference of private property in the subjective sense labor and the objective sense property and capital. You are only free when you possess. This follows from a conception of property as the externalization of rights, as an extension of one's individual personality. And this evid evidence of independence is resented by the lover, as Hegel notes in the early theological writings. The one who sees the other in possession of a property must sense in the other the separate individuality which has willed this possession. The property that destroys the unity of their life together is a, writes Hegel, dead object in the power of one of the lovers. End of quote. And here is the moment in which we might offer a glimpse of the answer to the question implied above. Does progressive feminism need Hegel? The shortest possible answer in Hegel's words is absolutely yes. <laughs> the claim that the gender difference is not based on nature, sex, or that it represents an essentialist idea, but that it is based on a specific ethical reasons that rely on the economic base, private property, but also uh, the monogamous patriarchal family that imposes the right of inher inheritance is the very program of the Marxist feminist critique. In this regard, we could say that Hegel provided us with analytical tools, and methods that he articulated phenomena on a conceptual level, described and explained the position of women in civil society and the family. In consequence, his philosophy, in fact, points out that the emancipation of women will not be possible if it is based only on naturalization, argumentation, and biological essentialism, without taking into account social relations and the role of state in it. If we are fighting against the oppression of women, then at the same time, our struggle has to involve the abolition of private property, the monogamous nuclear family, and state which ensures this dialectical flow. At the same time, this argument is also a key difference between Marxist feminist and liberal or radical feminist approaches to Hegel. Among the main radical feminist theories contesting Hegel, perhaps the most known is that of Carla Lonzi. Unlike Despot, 
Lonzi, an Italian art critic and feminist activist who is best known as the co-founder of Rivolta Feminile, an Italian feminist collective formed uh, in 1970s, advocated rejecting Hegel entirely in her manifesto Let's Spit on Hegel, Sputiamo su Hegel, demanding a new unknown subject and questioned women's claim for equality by stressing the patriarchal character of Hegel's dialectic and his theory of recognition. Lonzi asserts that the phenomenology of spirit is a phenomenolo phenomenology of the patriarchal spirit. Yet, beyond her vehement dismissal of Hegel, she finds in his work a formula for the destruction of patriarchal society the revolutionary alliance of women against the patriarchs. Freedom will be achieved when women reject the patriarchal family. Lonzi seeks a social and symbolic revolution in which women put themselves in the position of the subject, the position denied to them by phallogocentrism. This subject woman is the subject unexpected by the master-slave dialectic, the subject who claims her own transcendence. The main flaw of Lonzi's feminist approach to Hegel is that it's actually not dialectical. A fundamental protocol of dialectical theory is immanent criticism. Dialectical criticism insists that a more comprehensive standpoint can be gained only by absorbing the strengths of a theoretical perspective in the course of overcoming its eternal weaknesses, rather than dogmatically dismissing a contending theory, dialectical criticism instead enters into its system of thinking, engages it on its own terms, and integrates its most critical insights. True, Hegel urges, is not a thing. It is not a minted coin that can be given and pocketed ready-made. As David McNally argues, rather, truth resides in the process of critical thinking, which can only move through partial and one-sided understandings toward richer and more comprehensive ones. The theoretical approach that prevailed at a particular point in time cannot then be glibly dismissed as false. Even where it is transcended by a more robust theory, an earlier perspective full of false starts is still part of the history of truth as a process of discovery, exploration, and theoretical formulation. In the Phenomenology of Spirit, Hegel writes, the true thus includes the negative, what would be called the false if, would, if could be regarded as something from which one might abstract. The evanescent itself must, on the contrary, be regarded as essential, not as something fixed, cut off from the true. What Lonzi does in her critique of Hegel is actually falling into a transhistorical narrative when opening a discussion on the oppression of women. And even more, she uses a reductivist biological approach. She writes, woman, is oppressed as woman, at the level not of class, but of sex. The oppression of woman does not begin in historical time, but is hidden in the darkness of our origins. Finally, Lonzi underlines, black men are equal to white men, black women are equal to white women. This a rather dangerous essentialism tries to biologically base the difference between women and men while ignoring the historical and intersectional context of the origins of the women's oppression. As a way to illuminate the conservative conceptions of love, marriage and gender difference inscribed in Hegel's later work, Selah Ben Habib explores his early writings. This contrapositioning of texts leads to consideration of Hegel's presentation of Antigone in the phenomenology. Ben Habib concludes that women, along with the irony, tragedy, and contingency, are excluded from the Hegelian dialectic, whose vision of reconciliation has long ceased to convince. 
arguing that women need to restore irony to the dialectic by reclaiming the lives of its female casualties, Ben Habib presents a sketch of several German women who were Hegel contemporaries, women who were the foremothers of female emancipation. Thus, Caroline Schlegel Schelling and Caroline von Günderode, among others, are recalled to inspire a feminist discourse of empowerment. To translate Ben Habib's account on Hegel in just one sentence, he could do a better job being closely and privately surrounded by progressive women. A rather interesting essay by Ben Habib, a true classic, but unfortunately it remains locked in a liberal feminist positioning primarily because of its identitarian and a rather descriptive starting point. Despite Ben Habib's insisting on her story approach, she somehow fails to establish a clearer explanatory analysis of the problem of women's oppression i.e. to answer the key question, why were uh, women philosophers absent throughout the history and ignored by male philosophers? It is not enough just to rely on the descriptive point of departure without a clear explanatory historical or social material of the phenomena. Let us remind ourselves, it is Hegel who offers a model of human development towards freedom that is fostered by temporal, social and political context. That ought not to be ignored. Allow me to move now to social reproduction theory and closing remarks. Bear with me. Um, in Science of Logic, Hegel writes, in reproduction, life is concrete and its vitality, each of the individual moments is essentially the totality of all. Their difference is posited in reproduction as concrete totality of the whole. Social reproduction theory is all about life making. Its core tenet is the fact that the accumulation of surplus value in capitalism is not possible without informal and unpaid domestic labor that generates healthy labor power. In recent times, social reproduction theory has been used as a characteristic Marxist feminist tool, a theoretical and critical framework, and a political strategy for tackling the relationship between oppression and exploitation. It poses the question formulated in the words of Titi Bhattacharya, and it goes, if workers' labor produces all the wealth in society, who then produces the worker? Thus, social reproduction theory locates hidden processes that enable production, looks closely to behind the scenes to family relations, and marriage, and it seeks to investigate exist existential conditions of the worker and analyzes the phenomena of life making and produced gender reality. In more Hegelian words, social reproduction theory focuses on ethical life and brings it closely to the idea of the totality of the whole. Reality we perceive is only the partial truth, and that it appears to us in a particular historically specific form. Marx Capital concerns itself with demonstrating this difference between everyday experience of the surface phenomena determined by the prevailing mode of production and a scientific analysis of which goes beneath this service to grasp an essence. We thus, we thus need science to fully grasp the phenomena that remind hidden behind this appearance of the real. The hidden phenomena are not simply there waiting to be found. Empirical appearances, at Bhattacharya claims, then do not simply shroud some unspoiled truth or essence. There is a rather a relationship between hidden phenomena in the family sphere and empirical appearance. The question then becomes, as George Lukacs puts it, are the empirical facts to be taken as given or can this givenness be dissolved further into rational forms, i.e., can it be conceived as the product of our reason? In his Science of Logic, Hegel sets out a tripartite typology of models of interaction in the natural and human sciences. 
he identifies the three models in question as mechanism, chemism, and theleology. Mechanism involves a mechanical style of thinking. Um, the whole is considered to be a mere sum of indifferent parts. Chemism has the merit of acknowledging interactions among differentiated elements, but it too begins with the presumptions of atomism. In dialectical opposition to mechanism and chemism, Hegel turns to theleology. Hegel's fundamental argument in this regard is that life itself has a theological dynamic, i.e. life is purposeful. As Hegel explains, all life obeys a tendency to preserve and reproduce itself. We cannot comprehend our world and ourselves outside of an understanding of such life purposes. Among the most materialistic elements in Hegel's dialectic is his insistence that what pertains to life also pertains to thought. If life is animated by the purposefulness of a dynamic organic system, then thought, as an aspect of life, must obey the same imperative. Thought must be equal to the complex, manifold richness of life. It must seek out the real organic concept of the whole. There are relations of reciprocity rather than mechanism between parts and between parts and the whole, indeed. This is what it means to be a living organism rather than a lifeless mechanism. It is at this point in his analysis of life that Hegel introduces his concept of reproduction. A living organism, after all, must reproduce itself. Without reproduction, be it daily, seasonal or generational, life ceases. Moreover, is the organism as a whole that must reproduce itself, for it is the total organism that lives, biological or social. Individual organs live only through reproduction of the entire organism. In order for, so for society to survive, it needs to reproduce. Social reproduction theory points out that reproduction may elude either to the process of regeneration of the conditions of production, which enable society to survive, or the regeneration of humankind. To simplify, using an example of classical industrial labor, it would mean that reproduction is used to secure work operation, its regularity to invest into machines, factories, and raw materials. When machines break down, they need to be repaired, replaced, or have new ones purchased in their place. Moreover, the labor force which delivers the production and reproduces the relations of society must be secured. Analogous with the machines, when laborers grow old or they die, they are replaced, while those of working age need to eat, rest and renew their strengths in order to be fully ready for work. That is why the feminist analysis needs to look at the ethical life in its totality, both by focusing on the visible spheres, capitalist system of needs, meaning the civil society and the state, but simultaneously by integrating the backstage of these visible social relations, i.e. the nuclear family. A concrete totality attains concreteness through the differences that compromise it. At the same time, each of these different parts carries the whole within it. As elements of life, their reproduction is impossible outside of the living whole. Hegel writes, it can therefore be said of theological activity that in it, the end is the beginning, the consequent, the ground, the effect, the cause, that it is a becoming of what has become. This is one of the reasons why abstract debates of the is patriarchy, patriarchy necessary to capitalism sort are so decidedly flawed. One can, cannot know such things in advance on the basis of principle abstracted from concrete historical life. What we can say is that the actual 
historical process by which capitalism emerged in our world integrally involved social relations of patriarchal domination. From the standpoint of the effect, patriarchy in capitalism, we can say definitely that patriarchy is a necessary feature of the historical capitalism in which we live. The effect thus become a cause, and it is systematically reproduced in and through the reproduction of the capitalist mode of production. Therefore, when Lonzi say the oppression of women does not begin in historical time, but it is hidden in the darkness of our origins, that is exactly the opposite of the dialectic account of totality, where the oppression is a constitutive element of capitalism, therefore it has its historical content. Or, when Ben Habib insists on identitarian her story approach in terms of the critique of patriarchy, but not taking into account specific historical and social contexts, therefore her critique of Hegel misses the concept of totality. In the single, historically created system in which we live, all of relations of social power, from gender, racial, sexual domination to capitalist exploitation, form a complex social form um, and social whole, one in which each of the individual moments is essentially the totality of the whole. In the shortest possible of conclusions, I am not just suggesting uh, a pure feminist reading of Hegel, but rather a Marxist feminist contribution to the interpretation of Hegel. Do allow me to agree with already cited Blaženka Despot. With his philosophy, with his intervention on freedom, Hegel becomes a necessary starting point for the foundation of a certain Marxist feminism. In Hegel's writings, we are not merely faced with a problem of family, and patriarchy simply and self-evidently, but also with the account of the fact that they represent the very basis of the reproduction of capitalist society. In order to solve this Hegelian problem in Marxist feminist terms and to set the terrain for the actualized freedom and emancipation of women, we have to approach this goal in its totality on the long run, which is a rather difficult and unusually unlikable task. We have to move in the direction of anti-capitalist solutions, therefore including the abolition of private property, but at the same time by dismantling the patriarchal concept of monogamous, nuclear family, as well as the heterosexual religion of marriage. But that's luckily another heavy topic that I will selfie leave for some other occasion. <laughs> Okay, thank you so much for the talk. We can start with the discussion. Please, Andrea. Uh, just a moment for the microphone. Thank you. Thank you so much. This was really stirring and um, thought-provoking. So I, I, I wondered if you could say a little bit more about the sort of experimental possibilities that you see as compatible with Hegel's method. So I took you to be saying that um, it's, it's a historical fact that capitalism was conjoined with patriarchy, but it's not necessary that there be this connection. And once we change some aspect of the social totality, who knows how things will look. <laughs> um, and so we have to have this kind of experimental approach because we don't know in advance how the totality will be affected once these discrete um, institutions or practices are, are changed. And so I'm wondering if you think there's more to say about the constraints on this experimental approach um, within Hegel's context. And I was thinking about it especially in terms of the debate in socialist feminism between socializing domestic work versus waging it, right? The wages for housework approach versus those that argued in favor of socializing it. Um, I'm wondering if you think there's sort of Hegelian resources for going one way or another <laughs> on this particular question. Yes, uh, thank you, Andrea, so much for your questions. Uh, the first one, the experimental one. Um, I think I think um, I, I try to tackle it a little bit more in in the direction 
um, as evidently uh, in, in Marxist terms, especially Marxist feminism. Uh, there are different strands even within the Marxist feminism, but what it really suggests is that at, at a certain point we have to look upon the capitalist mode of production as a simultaneous process that um, somehow um, uh, is, is not divided between the social reproduction and production, but that is a totality. So I think that the first thing is to somehow, when you speak about labor, you include the questions of gender. When you speak about gender, you include the questions of labor, not as separate you know, logics, but not as intersectional different approaches, but as really as a totality. And I think that no other theory could be more helpful than, than Hegel in this point. This is basically it, because he really approaches it and on the levels explaining it, and of course we had to suffer the consequence of, of, of it, of the idealistically speaking, but then again I think this is one, uh, the one level of the problem. The other one uh, dealing with the experiment is definitely in terms of a really uh, nuanced critique of family. Not just in terms of um, gender roles or a marriage, but also by speaking, abolishing the family. So it's, I think, again, again Hegelian uh, notion, but not the meaning. Of course, it's something else there. So when Marxist feminists are experimenting, uh, suggesting the abolishing of family, they speak about socializing the work in the family sphere. So I think this is really good connection between Marx and Hegel. Um, uh, about a more concrete topic on 70s and domestic labor debate and wages for housework, um, since then, we developed different uh, social reproduction theories. I think that the most, um, the two most known ones are the unitary theory and dual systems theory. So um, uh, unitary ones do not agree with the wages for housework. They suggest it has to be on the level of the state. It has to have its infrastructure, the socializing needs to be more involved, not in terms of the money, in abstract terms, but more in terms of infrastructure on the universal level. Um, the other camp, dual systems theory, as Silvia Federici, Leopoldina Fortunati, and, and uh, you know the Italian camp, they somehow believed that the most valuable thing in order to make reproductive labor more visible is to ask for money, because it was, you know, this is this is a thing which we use, as, and on the abstract level, is something that we use and understand in, in most, most, I would say, uh, basic terms. When someone, something is a commodity, it has value and price, then capitalism understands it. That's why I think they never even wanted, you know, to get paid for the, for the job, because you cannot measure all the job uh, this, uh, all, the, all, the, all the labor at the same length. I mean, uh, you cannot count uh, uh, what time do you need to wash the dishes or having sex or something. It's not an abstract, it's really concrete. That's why they never suggested, you know, the money as, as a concept, but rather as recognition, like to make a certain point in the terms of Marxism. Yes, thank you very much for, for the paper. It was really interesting, and, and uh, I was happy to discover a despot whom I didn't know yes. before. I have some scattered remarks, uh, both on Lonsi and, and Federici and social reproduction theory. Um, Lonsi, I'll start with Lonsi. Yes. So you were saying, indeed, that Lonsi's reading of Hegel is not dialectical, and, and I agree with that, but of course, this is because dialectic is the problem. Dialectic has the uh, regolamento di conti tra collettivi di uomini, the idea that it's yes, a confrontation exactly. between collective of men that would not allow any space, any room for women to exist from within it. Yes. Um, and I was thinking, so that, I mean, I don't know if you agree with that, but then Lonsi also has a very specific dialectic reading of the dialectic. Yes. Dialectic is never triadic, like the Hegelian dialectic is really this a binary um, unfolding that um, can, cannot but be rejected, cannot be overcome, needs to be left aside. Yes. Um, th the other thing about the, the trans-historical approach of Lone Sea, I'm, I, I mean, I, I'm with you, I, I, of, of course there's a certain essentialism must take, but 
saying that she has a transhistorical approach or a high historical, I mean, transhistorical maybe, not high historical, first of all, because uh, I would say her first reproach to Hegel is precisely to have the historicized uh, oppression of women. So having uh, justified by a certain theology and teleology uh, the, the oppression of women um, and not having had an historical approach to it. Well, she tries to engage with historical formation in order to show that actually there is an historical origin for the oppression of women, even though the oppression of women doesn't, doesn't start with modernity, doesn't start with capitalism, predates it. Um, so I, I don't know. I, I, I think we, we don't do justice to Lunzi by s saying that she has a, a transhistorical approach. Although the sentences that that you quote about, like a, I think uh, Cherry, with them. yeah, yeah, uh, it was well pictured. But I think that uh, she also has a, an historical engagement with historical formation, and so also an historical approach. Um, and um, regarding social reproduction theory and Hegel, um, I think it's super interesting to think. Uh, you know, with Hegel uh, towards reproduction th uh, theory, social reproduction theory. I was wondering, because now you, you started this debate about Federici and, you know, the, the distinction between um, the campaign for wages for housework. I'm, I'm, for example, I'm, I'm not sure whether for Federici, uh, the, you know, the claim for the wages was literally a claim for the wages. For Dalla Costa, no, yes. it was, but, but for, for Federici, I think that there are moments where she said, um, the, the, the goal is to uh, point to this capitalist theft, this capitalist robbery, which actually um, veil or uh, labor and um, makes it love. Lo chiamo un amore, noi lo chiamiamo lavoro non pagato. So basically, I think that thinking with Hegel would allow to, to really grasp or disclose or uncover and unveil this dimension for Hegel, indeed, love has nothing to do with the family, or, I mean, not nothing to do, but it's not the ground of the family. Actually, this gender division of labor is essential to the family, so Hegel would agree with Federici. So I think it, like the rapprochement between Hegel and social production, not only in the Battacharya's version, but also going back to uh, the old um, uh, wages for housework, uh, against housework a campaign could work. Yes. Yeah, yes. Oh, great, great. Thank you so much for 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 questions. Um, uh, the Lonzi and uh, dialectical, non-dialectical reading, and, and problem of, of transhistorical uh, implications. Um, true. I have to be honest. I I really picked out specific quotes. Just you know to make it more more spectacular and you know just to somehow make you know the terrain for marxist feminism but to be honest of course of course it has its historical implications but what she really doesn't do is to historicize oppression it seems like it's just there and it begs the questions what are the actual origins is patrick is something transhistorical is it applicable to different modes of production in you know feudalism and so this is maybe maybe just the reason and when i said it's not dialectical it's because of her rather dramatic statement of dismissing the hegel as something dogmatic even though she builds from she starts with him like we need to change it in terms of not phallocentrism, but revolutionary towards the freedom. Women will do their job. So definitely there are some uh, really interesting points, but that's why I went a little, little back explaining that there is no false theories. It's a totality of different engagements, and if you want to follow the development of the truth, you need to engage with falsehood, not just dismissing it. Uh, that was the reason. Um, the social reproduction theory in Hegel, I completely agree that this might be the other, also the, the addendum to, uh, to my point. Um, but what, what is specific to, to Federici and maybe the reason why wouldn't she completely agree uh, uh, with Hegel is his insisting on universal and the role of right and the state. She's more to say in anarchistic approach so maybe in terms of why uh, wages it 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 would make some uh, i would say some uh, other inclinations and then again i agree uh, never wages uh, for housework was about money it was really the recognition 
of unpaid domestic labor. It was a political statement, not economical, if I can just vulgarly uh, put it there. Um, uh, and then the question of gender division of labor and the love which, you know, love is labor. Um, it's, I think, really a, a good point. It's not explored. And if I may say so, the whole conference and the feminist approaches to Hegel are rather new ones. It's really beginning. Maybe it's not polished. It's not completely elegant. That's why we need this kind of conversations, just not to be left alone thinking if it's cool or not. But yes, definitely, I think that the question of love in terms of labor is a good starting point for the development of the link between uh, Hegel and social reproduction theory. Um, I already, during the break, talked with Andrea about the gender division of labor. I'm always rather skeptical about that, Santa, uh, th that notion, uh, only because it also you know, smells like a trans-historical problem. You have gender division of labor since ever. No, you don't. So we need to make it more historical, more precise to see what kind of reproduction, feudalism, what kind of reproduction, capitalism, and maybe going from there in the questions of gender division of labor. That's why I think that this openness of the you know, flow of dialectics toward freedom is probably a good aspect, you know, just showing that it's moving, it's not fixed there. So that's why, that's why we need Hegel. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for your talk. It was very engaging. Um, I'm going to build a little bit on what Jamila said about Lonzi because I would... I, so, I think that Lonzi is mostly the manifesto of Sputiamo su Hegel. It's a very specific text that happens in a very specific moment and it is a call to action. It is a manifesto. So even the sentence, like the way she expresses women's position and situation, which can be understood as essentialist if we read it from a very conceptual, almost a historical perspective. When we go to that moment, I don't think it is that much. It is contentious. She is starting a fight, but that's what she wants. Yes. And it also has to do with Definitely. the discussion at, at that moment between which kind of oppression is should be prioritized. So should we look at class struggle or women's struggle. And here she's setting her bet on the table. She's saying it is women's struggle that goes first. Yes. And that is why she makes also some of those very strong statements. Mm -hmm. So I do agree that from a Marxist perspective, Lonzi's approach is not very useful theoretically, depending on how we grab it. But I think from a revolutionary point of view, from an action point of view, it actually is. That's what she's saying, let's do it. Let's not fall into the logic of recognition where we have to become men to be able to be recognized. Mm -hmm. That's what she's arguing for there. Yes. And that's why she's saying women are parallel within that fight of master-slave. Yes. So I think, um, for me, it's a very compelling text. The first time I read it, I was appalled. The second time I read it, I was like, wait, maybe there's something here. <laughs> By the third time, I was thinking, oh, she's, you know, like, we might actually even be able to do something with it nowadays, even with how she speaks about women, because what she's saying is not so much, it's not a biological essentialism. It's more where the women speak from, where are they listened from? Are they listened to? So I think, I don't know, I, I yeah, okay. I think it's important to situate her as well because otherwise she kind of like gets left out. And and I mean, honestly, first time I read her, I was like, what is she doing? But the more I read her, the more I think yeah, mm, yeah. there's a point. Thank you, so, yeah. thank you, Teresa, for a sympathetic uh, you know, account on, on Lonsi. Absolutely, she, I think, is like, uh, it, that, that, that manifesto is actually a classic and should be a part of syllaba on, on, on philosophy, especially if we teach Hegel. So I think that it bears this political scandal, the drama, the revolutionary potential, definitely. I mean, 70s in Italy, I think that hopefully we, we know what, what we're speaking about. So yes, I agree completely, but we have to you know, understand that the, the moment you try to explain uh, the, the oppression of women by saying that black men are equal to white. So it's, it's, it's really like, like, you know, 
theoretical something something just to make the point between liberal feminist yeah, and radical yeah. but definitely it really has potentials epistemological but also revolutionary ones so yes i completely I, agree and i agree with you that it doesn't and I agree work with you. if we go like if we go and look at the historical it's like ah but yes as a breaking point i think yes. it's, it's I, I, really I, I relevant agree. i agree i agree um, yeah, thank you very much. I actually agree with everything you said, I think, so uh, I'm very happy for your talk. Um, and I didn't know Despot either, so her name is Despot? Uh, Despot. It's, 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 yeah. She was a Praxis member, the Marxist okay. Hegelian. Yeah, so I, um, I'm um, happy that I know her now and <laughs> will um, read um, her. Really, really interesting. Yeah, that's, uh, that's great. Um, I just wanted to add one thing. Um, because you just said um, history, uh, the historical approach is so important in Hegel and, and not um, making statements that are, are historical. And um, I totally agree. And um, also uh, concerning gender division of labor, of course, because it's really a, a product of history. And uh, so I just wanted to add something that um, came to my mind all day uh, today. Um, that's also, I think, something that we can learn from Hegel, or that's something that Marx actually took from Hegel. Um, we are not just free in the way we um, live our reproduction or our, our reproductive um, forces or how we, how we produce. <laughs> mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. um, Hegel does not sit down and ask himself, so how should family look like? <laughs> um, that's not what he does. And I think that's important because he tries to understand yes. modern family as, uh, as a product of history. And I think he has quite, even though, of course, it's, it's, it's uh, um, I cannot read it without you know, being uh, horrified by, uh, by the perspective of being uh, the uh, pirate, uh, the, the house, house uh, wife. Um, but um, um, still, I think it's, it's very important that the dialectic approach, and that's something that Marx uh, takes from Hegel and Marx and Engels, um, makes Absolutely. us understand that we are not just uh, free and it's not like we have to um, write some kind of utopia of yes. the family, but we have to solve problems yes. that are, you know, like the product of history. And I just want to add that because that was something that um, mm -hmm. I think, uh, well, I, I will also talk about Marx and Hegel, so, uh, <laughs> uh, but with a totally different uh, point of view, not because uh, um, I'm... I agree with you, but I will um, uh, look at other aspects of, of uh, Marx's critique of Hegel. Um, but I think that's an important um, thing to see because that makes us able to um, see the strength in Hegel's approach and still say, of course, we have to, to go further on and uh, it's, um, it's uh, just relatively, yes. it's false, but at the same time, we can learn something from it. <laughs> so, yeah. In yes, a dialectical th thank sense. you, thank you so much. And again, yeah. I agree. <laughs> oh, uh, what I uh, maybe maybe would like to add that th th this 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 horrible anxiety you have when you bear the experience of being a woman, a philosopher, Marxist, Hegelian. <laughs> It's, it's really a heavy task. It really it is a heavy, but it's, it's a permanent anxiety. Yes. Yes, yes. As, as Teresa said about yes, as Teresa said about Lonzi, then the third, the fourth reading of it, then it becomes more clear. But what is I think absolutely fantastic about uh, Hegel's approach to family that it's really not moral. It's not on moral grounds, not even ontological. It really sets up you know, the terrain for explanation. And once you, you know, they have the structures and you can relate and understand what's going on, then we will strike and, you know, dismantle the thing. So that's why I think that, you know, this, 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 this nuanced concentration on not, excuse me and pardon my language, not bullshitting about the family, but really engaging in it historically and puts it in a totality is, is great because that, that's, that's what we need to set a step aside from ontology of family and, and morals. Yeah, as Andrea said, I mean, we can still see that the uh, division of labor is, is very strong and when the, sorry, I, I just want to add that um, you, you said today that um, uh, the pandemic, for example, showed us that the division of labor is, is still um, there. I mean, 
we might not like it, and maybe Hegel uh, justifies us, but it's it's going on, <laughs> and um, he, yes. he helps us to understand actually what's going on in a way. But we, we need we, Marx to yes. <laughs> overcome it, <laughs> yes. which okay. is not merely a descriptive level, but yes, it it, it bears the explanation. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank Other you. Other questions? <laughs> thank, thank you. you.